Hello, and my name is Marty Johannes, and I am the careers and personal finance librarian for the Johnson County Library. I want to welcome you to Exposing the Myths of Retirement Investing, presented by Emerson Hartzler. A little bit about Emerson. After a distinguished career as a business executive, Emerson retired in 2007 um, and pursued a new career. He assumed the role of Director of Pro Bono Services for Triune Finan Financial Partners for eight years until 2015. He continues to maintain an independent pro bono financial practice. He has served over 350 individuals and families in the community do doing all of his work on a pro bono basis, in other words, without charge. Much of Emerson's work with clients involves helping them to plan and manage their income and expenses on a monthly basis so that over time they can achieve financial success. In addition to this series. He also presents the 21st Century Budgeting with Met.com program for the Johnson County Library. Exposing the Myths of Retirement Investing is a three-part series. In the first session, Emerson presented on understanding the stock market. Last week's session was on taming the emotions that hurt investors. And you can access those recordings on our personal finance page or by going to Johnson County Library's YouTube channel. Today's session is on withdrawing funds during retirement. As questions come to mind during the presentation, please enter them in the chat, chat box. Uh, you can enter them so that everyone can see or they can be sent directly to me. We'll pause as needed during the presentation to allow Emerson to answer any questions that you submit. And after a couple of polling questions, we'll have some Q&A at the end of the presentation. Emerson? Thank you, Marty. Uh, this will be more fun. Uh, we, we, went, we went through a lot of uh, things the last two weeks. And, and for those of you who are joining us for the third week, thanks for coming along for this wild ride. It's a, a lot of information, I know. But uh, today we get to talk about withdrawal rates, which is near and near to my heart. I've been retired now for about 13 and a half years. And so studying it is not just an academic exercise. It's, it's something that I'm very much interested in uh, day to day, month to month, year to year. So, uh, uh, and I have then the pleasure today of showing you some of my work. The charts and graphs we've been looking at are all uh, taken from somebody else's research, somebody else's work, and you're going to see some of my work today, which uh, we'll, we'll see how that how that goes. Uh, anyway, I would uh, I want to go share the screen at this point in time and do a quick review of what we've covered uh, so far. And that should get you to. Right. Good. So um, I'll get this in a little larger later on, but for now, I want to hit a couple of highlights. So we started out this whole uh, presentation by saying, well, I'm here as a surrogate for somebody who really knows this stuff. And a, a better person to, uh, to give it would be Warren Buffett. So we started out with a quote of Warren Buffett, and I want to read that again just to remind ourselves. Uh, he, he said, uh, and he, I've heard him say essentially this many times, but um, so he's, he's uh, suggesting that um, the, for uh, 95 to 98% of Americans, and I certainly put myself in that category, uh, uh, low cost diversified funds that track indexes are the best approach for investing. So we looked at those four things and uh, unpacked things a little bit. Low cost, that is uh, market-based or, or index type funds. Diversified, we talk a lot about what does that really mean? And we talked about a defensive diversification and offensive diversification. 
uh, index funds. And these are funds that are, are managed by tracking an index rather than picking specific stocks. And then of course, mutual funds that get you the diversification that you need uh, because most of us aren't Warren Buffett. So those were the four basic recommendations that, that were made. Uh, through the course of this whole thing, and I don't have a slide on this, but we've exposing the myths. I just, I wrote down five of them that we've touched on already. One is that seniors should move away from stocks and I hope to give you some more data today to prove that that's not prudent. Uh, second, the stocks are too risky for senior investors. Well, the risk that I, we talked about the three types of risk, the risk that I'm most concerned about is inflation. And we'll talk some more about that today. Uh, so, you know, stocks are the only thing you can really uh, realistically invest in that will counteract inflation. Uh, third, uh, investing time frame for seniors is relatively short. And we tried to put that to rest on the early slides saying, you know, you have at 65, certainly you, you may have a 20 to 30 year planning horizon. And if you uh, want your estate to go to heirs, uh, they're gonna be younger uh, probably, and they'll have a planning horizon. So I use 30 years as just a general rule. That's, that's not short term, that's long term. Uh, then uh, the fourth one was senior investors cannot recover from market downturns. I had a question last uh, week about, well, what happens if we go through a great depression again? And I went back and got some data on that. And that also shows that, yes, you can recover. So that's a myth. And then uh, finally, one we'll talk about it, uh, a lot today is that the maximum percentage of investment withdrawal is 4% uh, annually. You'll hear that number thrown out a lot of times. And uh, uh, I want to try to unpack that a little bit today. So one of the slides that I showed, this is one of my favorite slides. And again, I apologize, it's busy. But uh, wh what this shows is as the stock market, and this is the S&P 500, goes down, this is 2008, my, my retirement year, <laughs> bad timing, the market goes down, funds flow out of, these are inflows and outflows, the stock market, and, and people get nervous, and they get scared, and they sell out, and, and most of them sell out at the very bottom point, and they don't buy back in until things are going great again, so that's a problem, so uh, I got just picked up an article the other day that says, in March, this was published in March 13, 2020. Now you remember what happened last year, uh, at the end of February, this COVID thing came to light. And of course the stock market went crazy, all right? And so uh, it was horrible uh, downturn, but it lasted until August. So from uh, March 13th to uh, the 1st of August was the, the bear market, if you will, during that very short period of time. But uh, this is from Bloomberg, investors allocated a record 137 billion with a B, 137 billion to cash like assets over the five days ended March 11. So in five days, uh, you know, this is, this is quarters. And in five days, they allocated 137 billion to cash. They sold stocks and went into cash. Uh, in, in five days. Well, all of those people uh, got absolutely torched in their rates of return because, you know, it, it just, uh, it, it, was, it was crazy. Uh, then, oh, I wanted to show you, we talked about uh, the rule of 72. And I wanna go back and look at a slide here that just continues to amaze me. And that's this one. Now, someone had a question, uh, were these numbers inflation adjusted? They're not, but, uh, and that's kind of the answer I gave, although I wasn't sure. Uh, it wasn't a very good answer, quite frankly, because I think the good answer is it doesn't matter. And if you look at this, uh, treasury bills, which, you know, are a real, real safe investment, if you believe in the U.S. Treasury, but over a, uh, what's this, 96 year period or so, a dollar 
grew to a whopping $21, while the stock market is north of $7,000. Now, I mean, comparing 21 bucks at three or 4% to 7,000 at 10%, I mean, it's just ridiculous. And so the rule of 72 is something we ought to unpack a little bit because it was brought up and, and uh, I think this is, is quite instructive. So I made a little chart of this uh, rule. There you go. So is, is this really right? So the rule of 72 uh, takes the number 72. And if you divide that by the rate of return, you get uh, how many years it takes to double. So if you get a 10% ret rate of return, the rule of 72 tells you that it, your money is going to double every 7.2 years. Uh, at 3%, which is inflation, the rule of 72 says it's going to double every 24 years. Now, if you're, you know, retiring and you have a 30-year planning horizon, well, your money is going to, you know, the cost of living is going to double in 24 years. So that has to go into your plan. And we'll talk about using a certified financial planner later. But that, that's one of the really important things you have to do is to anticipate that sort of thing. But there's only four doublings in 96 years then. If it doubles every 7.2 years, then it's going to double 13 times in 96 years. If it doubles every 24 years, it's going to double four years, four times in 96 years. So it's just simple math. So if you take a dollar balance, which is basically what we did in this chart, started with a dollar over here, and you say, okay, well now what's going to happen to that over the 96 years? Well, if it's at 4%, it's going to double four times. So it goes from one to two, that's one, two, three, four times, you end up with 16 bucks. That is, in fact, what we have over here. So inflation was a little bit more than 3% uh, during that time. However, if you invested at 10%, it's going to double every 7.2 years. There's 13.3 doublings. Well, okay, one, two, one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, it's 8,000 bucks. So that's your 16 versus 8,000. I mean, this is the rule of 72 just illustrates the compounding, uh, interest compounding, which Einstein said was the eighth wonder of the world. So that's how you get these kind of crazy numbers. Now you say, well, okay, fine, but that's an academic mathematical exercise. Let's bring that down to something more practical. So I talk about um, a planning horizon of, uh, uh, let me get this to move. There you go. Of 30 years, which I think is reasonable to assume for many, many people. So uh, if many, Financial advisors will say, okay, 10% uh, is what you might get in the stock market over a long period of time, but stock market's risky, goes up and down, you know, you don't sleep at night, whatever, whatever. Let's just go to a 50 50 uh, split of stocks and bonds, right? So that sounds reasonable. Uh, now we know from history that instead of 10%, that 50 50 split's going to give you about seven and a half. We'll look at some more numbers later on today that will verify those kinds of numbers. So that doesn't look too bad. I mean, that's good, good rate of return. I mean, that's all I need, so forth. Well, let's use the rule of 72 and see what happens. Uh, at 10%, again, we said math is pretty easy. It's going to double every 72.2 years. So in 30 years, you're going to have 4.2 doublings, right? It's going to double 4.2 times. At 7.5, it's going to double every 9.6, OK? and Take 9.6 in the 30 years, you get 3.1. So no big deal, right? Well, it is. So let's say, and you could use any number, but let's say you retire with a million bucks and uh, you didn't withdraw anything. Uh, what's it going to look like? Well, here's one doubling, two doubling, three doublings. At the end of 30 years, you're going to have 8 million bucks. But if you, that's a 7.5% rate of return. But if you invested in stocks, it's 16,000. 
So when your advisor said, well, we can move into you know, 50, 50 stocks and bonds, it's no big deal. Well, you know, we're, we'll, it's smoother ride, true. It's safer, eh, maybe. Uh, you sleep better at night, maybe. What he isn't gonna tell you is you just lost $8 million. And to me, that's kind of real money. So <laughs> now you could use any amount you wanted here. We can plug it in. 500,000, it's 4 million versus 8 million. You only, only lost 4 million there. So uh, if the rule of 72 is something you really ought to know. It's very simple. Um, and it will, it will give you a pretty good answer about where you're going to end up uh, with, with your investments, assuming. So any, any change in your rate of return over a long period of time, like 30 years, will make a huge difference. In 30 years, that's going to be half the return that you would have gotten. So, you know, if you don't, not worried about that, or you're not concerned about that, um, you might check with your heirs because they might be. Uh, so one last thing, if I can find it. Ah, uh, yes. We'll, we'll talk about um, withdrawal rates. And that's where we're going to start today, if I can find that. Right. So let's go. OK, so uh, I get copies of a newsletter every month that's sent out by Nick Murray. Now, Nick Murray is kind of a consultant to CFPs. So he's the guru to the gurus, if you want to put it that way. And I like his, uh, I like his letter. I think it uh, is usually pretty good. And um, I'll make that go away. Maybe not. So uh, his letter came out here in December and he had some things that I thought would be interesting uh, to read to you. Uh, he starts out by saying, every household that's seriously accumulating assets for retirement has a number. You've seen this ad as, you know, what's your number of which at retirement will allow it to begin withdrawing something in the neighborhood of four to four and a half percent. We'll come back to that number later on, but that's his kind of recommendation. And escalating that withdrawal at trend line inflation. Okay, so you have so much money, uh, you have a, a number which will allow you to withdraw that much uh, every year uh, with little or no danger of exhausting their capital, okay? Then he goes on to say, and this is the real uh, uh, bottom line, the huge preponderance of those households is planning to go into retirement with a predominantly fixed income portfolio, bonds basically, because nobody told them that the essential financial problem of retirement has nothing to do with principle. The enemy is erosion of purchasing power, inflation. And that's what I've been trying to convince you. That's the risk I'm most worried about. The fact that at trendline inflation, living costs over a 30 year two person retirement will go up somewhere between 2.25 and 2.4 times, overwhelming a fixed income and exhausting their capital. Again, they don't know that and will not realize it until it's too late. Now this is a newsletter written to advisors, financial advisors, CFPs, but we, the CFPs do know it. Moreover, we know how to solve the problem with equities, of course. So uh, again, he's, he's a big equities guy. I agree with him. That's why I like his newsletter. Uh, but he's saying, if you're not into equities, if you're in the fixed income, inflation alone is going to, is going to uh, give you fits. Okay, so let's talk about uh, withdrawal rates. Uh, and uh, as I've said a number of times already, we as individual investors cannot control market prices. We can, however, control the number of shares we own and we can avoid selling in a bear market. Uh, we can wait until the stocks go, go up. However, 
I have been for the last 13 and a half years in a situation where I don't have any choice. I have to sell periodically. I sell every quarter uh, shares. Uh, so how how do you how do you make sure that you don't sell too many shares? Uh, and and that involves a financial plan. A very important part of a financial plan is a percentage of annual withdrawal rate. In other words, how, how much can you can you withdraw each year without running out of money before you run out of life? That's basically the whole planning planning thing. So that there should be a a percentage rate that uh, that you can withdraw each year, uh, and that ha has to be uh, very highly disciplined. Uh, and, and the discipline is selling only enough shares to provide the dollars needed in the financial plan. So, you know, any other reason uh, is verboten. So you may, tempt, may be tempted to think things like, well, the market seems overpriced today. I think I'll sell and take the gain. Well, we talked about how dangerous it is to be out of the market. Let's admit that person. Uh, so, or you might say, well, uh, the market's falling like a rock. I think I'll get out while the getting getting is good. I'm nervous, or I just saw the new Tesla. I have to have one, but my bank account is overdrawn already. So the answers to these kinds of questions are no, no, and no. Uh, you have to be disciplined in the withdrawal rate. So we talked a little bit before about uh, using a certified financial planner, and these guys don't come cheap, but uh, I think they are worth uh, their money. Uh, a, a good CFP is an effective antidote to fear and greed. So they're, they're, they earn their money by giving people counsel and giving them education, hopefully, uh, doing fire drills to say, this is what's going to happen to the market. Let's just be ready so that we're not caught off guard. And what are we going to do when the market goes down precipitously? Nothing different. What are we going to do when it goes way up? We're going to feel good about it, but you know we're, we're not selling out at that time either. So uh, th this is one of their big jobs among many, but just to calm the fear and greed, calm the emotions, and, and act as an outside third party uh, for that. So, uh, for example, uh, the last 16 years of my career, I said spent as the manager of a group of cardiologists. We had a, about 40 cardiologists when I left. It wasn't a bit like herding cats, but I, had, I was fortunate I had a good group. They were really great people. Anyway, every one of those cardiologists had uh, his or her own cardiologist and primary care physician. Uh, it was someone else. So yeah, I know everything about cardiology, so I can, I can treat myself. Well, physician heal thyself was not a motto. You had to have someone else uh, as your doctor. You could not be your own doctor just because you need an objective opinion on your health and you need an objective opinion as an investor on whether or not you're doing the right kinds of things. So I, the same is true uh, in the financial area. In fact, the group of CFPs that I use requires that each one of their CFPs have a CFP. And it's not looking in the mirror, it's somebody else. So they have to have their accountability partner too. So, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll do fire drills, they'll educate you and so forth. So uh, secondly, the CFP has a quote, fiduciary responsibility in that they must act in the best interest of the client. Uh, and if they don't, they're, they're open to sanction. Uh, there's a lot of other services they, they provide. Uh, but uh, uh, like mm, your life, you know, examining your lifestyle, budgeting for that, saving, investing, giving, how much money can you afford to give away? We'll talk about that a little later. Uh, risk management or insurance products. What do you really need, what you don't? Financial estate planning. I would go to a CFP first and then I would go to the estate planner because if you have a financial plan already baked in, then uh, your, your cost to put together a, a financial plan for your estate is gonna be more straightforward and, and less. Tax planning, there's a lot of issues there and so forth. So, you know, that's, that's kind of what you get. The going rate um, for a CFP is usually about 1%. 
uh, per year of the investment balance. Uh, so, you know, if you had a uh, million bucks, it's ten thousand dollars. Now, if you have over a million, uh, most of these people will uh, negotiate uh, a lesser percentage. Uh, so, you know, th that's kind of what you can expect. Uh, and again, if you're using index funds, you can add another 15 to 30 basis points on that. So your total cost of all your investment advice should be in the neighborhood of uh, 120 to 130 basis points, 1.2 to 1.3% per year. So we talked about, you know, low cost. That's in my, my opinion, what's low cost. I would be remiss if I didn't spend some time talking about uh, annuities because they are typically sold very aggressively uh, to people who are at or nearing retirement age. And so uh, there are some pros and cons. What, what they will say is, if you buy an annuity, we will guarantee a predictable income. Now, if you go back and think about the retirement funding that we've had over our lifetimes, prior to the time I got into the uh, business world, you typically had defined benefit plans. You went to work for Santa Fe Railway, AT&T, whatever. They put money aside into a fund that they controlled. And when you retired, they paid you X bucks a month for the rest of your life. That was the deal. You, you had nothing to do with it. You didn't have anything to manage. It is what it is, but it was kind of cool. You know, you worked there for 30 or 40 years and you probably died five years after you retired. But anyway, during those five years, you knew you had a guaranteed uh, predictable income. Well, then when I got into the, the business world, things started to change. The company said, you know, uh, some of these pension plans got into trouble. They were mismanaged. So the company said, well, let, let's just get out of this business. Let's go into a defined contribution plan, like a 401k, 403b, where we put in the contribution. We'll define what that is. And you can, you know, the employee can put his money in, we'll match it, so forth. And then that goes into a a 401k, 403b, which is under the name of the employee, not the, not the company. Well, that was good news for the company because they got out of their responsibility for managing the plan. And it's good news actually for the, for the employee because now it's in my name. I like that. I, I can make the decisions on how, how things are done. Well, a lot of people get, get fine. You know, now they're going to retirement. Maybe they roll their 401k into an IRA but now they've got to manage it. And they look at the stock market and say, oh my gosh, it's going up and down, it's scary. I would rather have a defined benefit plan. And so the advice, you could just see somebody in a corporate headquarters saying, you know, I've talked to enough of these people who are nervous about managing their own finances and they've got these, you know, uh, defined contribution plans and now they have to manage them in retirement. So let's design a product which gets them back in, in more of a guaranteed predictable income. So let's take their money, we'll invest it, we'll take the responsibility because we know what we're doing and we'll pay them something. And then, you know, the, the CFO of the company would come back and say, well, okay, tell me how we're gonna make money doing that. And they said, well, that's pretty simple. We'll invest the money in the stock market and we'll make 10% and we'll guarantee them a predictable income, which is based on 7%, which, you know, uh, <laughs> you read these documents and they're usually 30 to 40 pages. Uh, so, I, I mean, really, uh, I don't know. But anyway, that's, that, that's very, uh, a, a nice product to sell. It gives people comfort, they get a predictable income but the company's gonna make money and they're gonna take your money, invest it just like you would anyway, and they're gonna pay you something less. That's their business plan. Uh, so uh, I'd rather educate people and have them have control with the help of a CFP for their own money rather than giving that control to somebody else. Now, there are some people that can't uh, need and can't get life insurance. Sometimes you can get a rider on, on an annuity that will provide life insurance or even long-term care insurance. So there's some nuances. I wouldn't say that every annuity is bad. Most of them I've seen are bad, but uh, you know there are some reasons sometimes for doing that. The cons, there are many. Uh, the fees are, are high. Uh, the returns again, have gotta be lower than you can get. Or this company's not gonna make any money and that 
they're not in business, you know, as, as a welfare state. Uh, and there's less flexibility because they're guaranteeing predictable income. They're not, they're not gonna let you out of this contract right away. Most have surrender charges. You can get out for the first eight or 10 years. You're gonna pay a healthy penalty because they've got to get you know, the fees back. And they're highly complex. Like I said, most of them I've seen run 20, 30 pages long. And you know, if you don't understand how, what your investment is, if it takes 30 or 40 pages, I'm convinced the people who sell them don't even know what's in them. Uh, except they know what their fees are going to be. So uh, I'm, I'm just very skeptical of annuities. I've seen so many of them. I would say, oh my gosh, I wish you hadn't done that. But I think it's, it's, it's basically easier to sell than to educate the buyer. And that's what we're trying to do here is to give you the education so you don't just flee to a guaranteed predictable income at a high cost. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, using a financial planner. Uh, Again, it's an effective antidote to fear and greed. They have a fiduciary responsibility. Oh, we already talked about that, sorry. I went the wrong way. Oh, one of my favorite topics, uh, investment statements. Uh, this is one, um, these are four things you're probably are right. I'll leave this up for a while. Um, here are four things, and I, I found very few people who can really, take this quiz. Um, one, is the investment strategy recommended in line with the Buffett recommendation? In other words, the four principles, low cost, diversified index funds. Uh, probably 80 to 85% of the uh, mutual funds that are sold and owned today are uh, actively managed funds. They're not low cost index funds. So that eliminates about 80% of the people right off the bat. Secondly, what's the total amount I am paying of all the investment management? We talked about a good uh, rule of thumb might be 1.2 to 1.3% per year. What am I paying? And a lot of these special mutual funds, there's a lot of hidden costs. They don't ever report it to you. So the dollars, the percentage of the investment balance uh, that, that you're paying each year, you, you, ought, you ought to know that. Then third, what has been my average annual rate of return since the current investment strategy was put into place? They have that information somewhere. Most people are reluctant, most advisors are reluctant to give out that information because they don't want to be challenged. And then of course, here's the challenge. What has been the best mark rate of return over the same time period? And I, uh, I have investments, again, 10,000 companies in three different uh, mutual funds. And I benchmark mine against a world index of because that's what I'm trying to do is just mimic the uh, the uh, index of all the investments and in all the stocks uh, sold in the world. So uh, I've I've got a benchmark. So I've had people come to me and say, "Well, I said, well, how how are you doing?" And they said, "Well, I, I'm getting really a good rate of return." I said, "Well, can you define good?" I mean, I don't say this; these are my friends, but but uh, I want to say let's define good, and then. Uh, can we can we benchmark and say, well, if I got 12% last year, I feel pretty good. That's great. But the overall market, my benchmark got 15. Now I'm not so happy. And so again, you, you need to hold the people accountable by saying, tell me what your rate of return and is what your benchmark is. Let me uh, I get out of this. Yeah. Let me show you one more thing. There you go. Here's an example of what I see on a program that we've got with my advisor. I can go online. I just pulled this up. Uh, is today the third? Yeah, earlier today. <clears throat> this is, I have, I have three investment accounts because the government says I have to have three. I'd rather have one, but I've got three. So I've got an IRA under my name, an IRA from under my my uh, wife's name. That is Marjorie. It's my wife, and a, a Roth IRA under my name. So all these are uh, investments of the same. But I can look at any time online 
and look at my performance report. And uh, I get my total cost from them. I know what that is. I'm billed for it and I can see what my mutual funds are paying. So I know what my costs are, number one. So I, that, that's met. And I do follow the Warren Buffett recommendations, low cost uh, market-based index funds. Uh, here, the market value of that uh, account on the 3rd of March was 129,000. I can look at any, this is the period is, is you know, so far two months plus, uh, that's my return, it means nothing to me. Over the last three years, uh, it's averaged 8.26 per year. And since inception and this reporting mechanism goes back about eight years, it's a, not a lot of time, eight years, but it's something and it's pretty sensitive still under eight years to what time period you choose. And the markets was up uh, over the first of the year, five five percent. So this is a good time in the market. So since inception over eight, eight years, I've averaged 12.36. Again, if, if this number were 10, I'd be happy. Well, okay, is that, that looks really good. Uh, but how do I compare with the market? Well, if you had a 70-30 blend of stocks and bonds under the same uh, investment strategy, I would have averaged 8.62%. So I would have given up four percentage points as we talked earlier. That's a big deal. That's a lot. And then if you had bonds, I mean, nothing. Here's my overall benchmark. This is a world index. This is stocks all over the world. And that's what I'm trying to mimic. So I'm trying to get this return. And in the same time period, uh, that world index showed 11.26. So as long as I'm close to that, I'm pretty happy. I'm saying, I know what, and I can dial in any period I want, anything from the inception to today. I know what it's been in the last three years. I can choose five years. This is the number I look at. That's the only one I think is really important. And I look at it twice a year. <laughs> I just pulled it up for this presentation. That's the kind of information. What, what was my rate of return over a long period of time? And how does that compare with the benchmark we're trying to meet? And then what are my costs and how am I, uh, how am I invested? So let's go back. To this. Yeah, so four things ought to be in the statement. Is the investment strategy recommended in line with Buffett? What's the total amount of being paying for all the investment management, both in dollars and percentage of investment balance per year? What's been my average rate of return or since the current investment strategy was put into place? And what's been the benchmark return over that same period? So in summary, we want to invest in low cost, diversified index mutual funds. We want to mitigate all investment risks, business systemic inflation, again, business risk by owning a lot of companies, systemic by, by controlling how, how many shares we sell at any period of time, and inflation we mitigate by buying stocks. Uh, engage a CFP to help manage fear and greed and do a host of other things develop a financial plan with a disciplined withdrawal rate. We'll talk about that next. And then hold your CFP accountable uh, with, with what's, what's the rate I'm earning, what should I be earning and so forth. So that's, yeah, let's stop for just a minute uh, while I change uh, presentation materials and take questions that you may have. Uh, Emerson? Yes. We have a question about annuities. I already have an annuity. Would you recommend I cash it out? Uh, good question. And the answer is it depends, which is usually what you'll get from a financial advisor. Uh, most of the annuities that I've looked at are very difficult to get out of, uh, especially in the early years. They, they have what's called surrender charges. So they've set you up in a long range plan and uh, they're, they're gonna give you a guaranteed rate. So they wanna get fees out and they pay a lot of fees to the person who sold that annuity in the first place. So they've got, they've got to get that money back out. They use the eight to 10 years as a normal period. 
in that period, uh, the surrender charges are so onerous that usually you just can't get out of them. You just have to kind of wait it out. And as the surrender charges go down, then you can then you can get out of them. But that's that's one of the problems with an annuity. Once you buy it, you're pretty well stuck with it. And if it's a good one and you like it, fine, you know. But if if not, they're difficult to get out of. And usually we say just just hang on to it. Eventually we'll roll roll the money out into something more reasonable for you. Okay. Um, next question on your chart: comparing performance to benchmarks. Did you select the benchmarks? I've never seen three benchmarks for one account total on my investment statement. That's just the format that they have. Uh, and, and the only one that I'm really concerned about is the all world index. And that's what I benchmark mine for. And that's that's a recommendation because that more that is the most close this most parallel thing for where I invest. I'm always interested in, in some of these others like the 7030 because that tells me how much, uh, and you know, there are time periods where it's the other way around, you know, uh, that 70, 30 may be a better return than what I'm getting over a short period of time. But over a long period of time, I always like to see that because that gives me confidence that I'm still getting a lot more return for taking the risk that I'm taking with all stocks. So it's, it's useful in just making that, that comparison. But yeah, that's their standard format. And okay. the only one I look at is the one that's closest to my investment portfolio. Okay. That's, that's how I kind of hold them accountable. You know, if it, if it drops down below that significantly, then we, then we have a conversation, you know. <laughs> um, and then someone wants to see the summary slide again, perhaps at the end, you could show that again. Okay. Just leave that up a little bit if you want to copy it down. And again, if if any of you want wants to see this presentation, all you need to do is send uh, an email to me. My email is on the last slide, and we'll put that up pretty quickly. And I'd be glad to ship this to you. Okay. Doesn't cost anything to. So okay. That's the Gmail address. That's it for now. Okay, so now I'm going to go to the last bit of this presentation, which to me is exciting. It may not, may not be to you. And there are a lot of numbers, so we'll walk through it pretty quickly. So I, I'm into retirement. I'm all in stocks, uh, diversified portfolio and saying, okay, um, now it's 2007, uh, 2008, the market crashes. And by March of 2009, I have about half the dollars in my account that I started with and I'm not going back to work. So I got busy with data. I work with the Tryon people again in their offices for eight years. I still have a relationship with them, but I have a private office now. Uh, but they have data, it's wonderful. I just numbers, Oh my gosh, uh, again, Bloomberg's made a fortune getting this stuff out to people. But uh, so I made up a chart and said, okay, what if I start with a million bucks at retirement? I chose a million dollars just because it's a nice round number. And when you make up Excel sheets, it's easy to check the math. And I said, okay, what if I started with a million, I withdrew 60,000. Uh, the first year starting, and then I indexed that for inflation. So, you know, I got my life, my decadent lifestyles maintained. And that's, of course, 6% of uh, a million. So I'm starting with a withdrawal. And my, my naive analysis is, well, the stock market makes 10%. I pay a percentage or so uh, in expenses. So I get 9%. Inflation is 3%. So if I want to keep up with inflation, uh, I need to get, I, I, I can take out 6% and the 3% is still there, which will take care of inflation. The number of dollars I have will support my lifestyle. Okay, that's the theory. Well, uh, it's more complicated than that, obviously. This little chart though starts uh, with a, a, a beginning balance 
uh, of a million dollars. And then I got into the data and I look at each year and I looked at the rate of return for an all stock portfolio, world index type stuff. And that's in this column. So then the earnings would be whatever that is times the million dollars. Well, that's easy. It's 2.0% negative in 2000. I would have lost 20 grand. Inflation is 3.4% in 2000. And so my withdrawal is not 60,000, it's 61,000 of 20, because I got a half a year of inflation. That's 6.1 rather than six. And I end up with 918,000. So I look like, oh, that wasn't a very good. And then, you know, by 2002, I would have been at 621. So these numbers don't look very, very good. Uh, I can survive, but uh, the reason I chose 2000 is I looked th at the data in my lifetime. And I said, let's go test this 6% withdrawal rate in the absolute worst case scenarios that we can find. And I think the data, yeah, 47 years. So I went back 47 years uh, and, looked at, and looked at data. And I said, well, I'm gonna pick out the absolute worst years to retire. And if this will work in the worst years, then it's gonna go gangbusters in any good year. So that was my theory. So uh, the worst case scenario of all those 47 years, was year, if I retired in 2000, I had three consecutive years of bear markets. And that's very unusual, but it happens. So that's, that's the deal. Well, even in that scenario, 20 years later, I still got a little over half my money and I've taken out a million and a half dollars. That's inflation by year going up. The second worst case was my particular experience. I retired in 2007, started taking money out in 2008. Wow, 40% 40, 40 down. So I've lost 400,000 right off the bat. So this really has pretty much mimicked my actual experience. So I'm now a little bit more than I, in terms of nominal dollars, than I had when I retired. Here we were going from a million to a million seven, it's bumped around. We'll see, I think at the end of 2020, I don't have those numbers yet, uh, but I think this, this number will be probably a million one at that point in time. So I not only survived it, but in those 12 years, uh, to, and in 13 years, it's going to be over well, almost $900,000 taken out at these rates. So that's the second worst scenario. The third worst case scenario was 1973, back in the Carter years, and we had two years of declines. But that recovers pretty quickly, and that's the one I like the most because it's got all of the data, 47 years. If you retired back in 73, it was a bad time to start with, but today you'd have $19 million and you would have withdrawn a bunch. Well, you, you'd be withdrawing them. I mean, it's just crazy. So if you compare that with the bonds, you can move that out of the way. Um, if you retired in, in 1973, the worst, third worst case scenario, and you went into long-term corporate bonds, which is the most aggressive bond portfolio you could have. Well, guess what? You run out of money after 15 years. And here, after 47 years, you got 19 million. A really good case, then, if we started in 73, it's a third worst case scenario. Let's go up here. Uh, then what if, what if we retired in 1975? two years later, well, it goes crazy because you've got these kind of returns right off the bat. So after 16 years, you got 15 million. I just stopped at that point in time. The fourth worth case scenario was 1990. Uh, there again, it bumps around, but after 30 years, it's still have a million and a half. That's at a 6% withdrawal rate, okay? So these are the worst cases out of 47 years so three years out of 47, if you pick those years, you'd have a struggle. Every other year, 44 years out of 47, <laughs> this is dynamite. 
and it's so much better than 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 bonds. Uh, here it's five million versus two million. I mean, uh, one year after the worst case, two thousand and two, uh, it, it's still pretty good. Here you get, um, you know, just good. Now I had a I had a question about uh, last week, which is a good question. Well, what if we go through the Great Depression again? And unfortunately, the only index I have going back that far that I could get a hold of was the S&P 500, not the best. But you can see, I mean, this, during the 20s and, and the depression, this was a wild ride. I mean, you had minus 43 plus 47, crazy stuff. The inflation rate I, was minus six, minus 10 and 32. I mean, it, it was nuts. So a 6% withdrawal rate back in 29, Starting with a million bucks, uh, not so much. You, you at twelve, year twelve, uh, you're basically out of money. Uh, and I went back to 1926, at a six percent withdrawal rate. If you started in 1926 and got, as I said, people forget that in the three year, four years uh, prior to 1929, we had great returns. So if you started with a million bucks in, in 1926. Well, it went down to half, but you know, 30 years later, you're just fine. 1931, it would have been a struggle too. So you you would have survived now if you go back and look at the Great Depression, and you say, well, six percent, I'm going to run out of money. What if, what if we use five? Yeah, that extends it to 16 years at four. Uh, we can go 22 years before we run out of money. Don't like that. And uh, at 3%, you're just fine. After 30 years, you get double the money you had before, which will buy you about the same amount. And you've withdrawn these kind of funds over that year. So the, so the, the end product here is even with a withdrawal rate of 3%, if you had a million bucks or whatever number, you can use any number you want. Uh, you would have survived the Great Depression taking out 3% a year. Now we can play around with this stuff all we want. We get just a few minutes. Um, I like 6%. How about 7? Which is, you know, I'll admit to you has been kind of where I've been so far. And if you look at this, 7% uh, rate in my case, retiring 2007. Uh, you survive it, probably you're up close to back to a million after 2020. We'll see how that goes. Uh, 8%, uh, I still have almost half of what I had. And again, that's the second worst case scenario. A really good case, 1975, no problem. 8% reserve. Fourth worst case, uh, you go out for 21 years. Here's another good case, no problem. So, you know, if you retire and you find the first few years are really good, um, you might start out with five or 6%. You can bump it up to eight or nine later on if you wanted to. And why is that important? Well, um, I get questions like, okay, I've got this money. I want to pass some on to my heirs. I certainly don't want to run out of money before I run out of lifetime. But, you know, there's some things I'd like to do with money while I'm here. You know, maybe uh, I would like to gift some money to relatives to help with their education. Wonderful. Fund their 529 account. How much money can I afford to give and still survive these things, knowing that I need 6% or 5 or whatever it is? Uh, so those kinds of issues are, are I think, very important. Uh, if you can afford to, to spend some money, if you can afford to, uh, especially in giving, I mean, so many things you can do, you know, it's not like we're all Bill Gates and can solve some disease in Africa, but, you know, I've got relatives who are struggling to pay off student loan debts uh, or go to college or whatever. I've got charities that I like to, to fund. How much can I afford to give away while I'm living where I really get some enjoyment out of it? So there's just some examples. These, these are important numbers. And this kind of an analysis, I've done this on the Excel spreadsheet. The CFPs have much more 
sophisticated tools to use. And so going in and asking these kinds of questions are, are vitally important. You know, how, what, what can I do with my money while I'm still living? How much do I need to save for my, my retirement? Uh, how much can I withdraw each, each year and still be, still be safe, not run out of money? Very, very key question. So I thought this was kind of fun to do. Uh, uh, I, I've used the 6% target so far. Um, I'm doing just fine. I, I think it's going to work out uh, really well for me. And again, this analysis shows some, some tough times, but I picked out three, three scenarios or four scenarios out of 47 years where you'd have to be pretty careful uh, taking three or 4% out. But the other 43 or 44 years out of 47, you know, you just, you can't, this, you can survive these downturns. And, and again, the stock market is gonna be up three years out of four of the downturns are usually, uh, you know, could be severe, but they're usually short term. So if you have a disciplined withdrawal rate and you stick to it and you stick to your plan and you review it every year with your CFP, you're gonna be just fine. That's the end of my diatribe for today. I hope this gives you some comfort, I, it did me. And so far again, as they say, I, I picked the second worst time in my lifetime to retire <laughs> and I'm still here. So there you go. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and um, pose a couple of polling questions for you all to answer while we um, um, look at questions. Um, one question that has come in um, is, in light of the fact that long-term investing in bonds provides a much lower rate of return, do you recommend holding any bonds? Uh, it, it, again, it depends. Uh, if if you have a financial plan, and and you're you're thinking about the withdrawal rate that will last, uh, will get you through your lifetime without running out of money. Uh, stocks are still your best bet. Um, you know, if, if if you don't have enough money to make that work. Uh, if, if you're, you know, elderly, uh, your life expectancy is not that great, uh, you know, and it's just a matter of conserving what money you do have, uh, yeah, I'd go to a more conservative investment. For, for most of us, uh, if, if we've got enough uh, money to, to, to think about uh, how do we withdraw, can we have a reasonable withdrawal rate? And still not like the four, five, six percent, and still not run out of money, then absolutely stay in stocks uh, for all of those kind of people. So if you really don't have the resources you need, then then you've got to be more conservative just to, to serve them, conserve your funds. But for most of us uh, that have have investments and have planned ahead, uh, it's uh, it's probably going to be better just to stay in the stock market. You certainly shouldn't get out because you're afraid of the ups and downs. It will give you the best return. And Emerson, um, as we close, can you um, display your last slide with your email address on it? Okay, great. Okay, well, Emerson, we're at three o'clock, so we'll go ahead and end our program. Thank you again for this awesome series. I know that for me personally, I it has put it has given me some comfort um, in knowing what direction to go in the future. Um, so I really appreciate all this great information. And I thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. And if you would like to view the recording of this and or the other uh, two programs in this series, uh, this will be posted on our personal finance um, online programs archive, um, probably by the first part of next week. And um, also you can see it on our YouTube channel 
channel, Johnson County Library's YouTube channel under our career and finance playlist. Thank you so much.